essential to hold the perpetrators accountable and to do what we can in our lifetimes to indeed assure a better future. Please welcome Professor John Q. Barrett, board member of the Robert H. Jackson Center and professor of law at St. John's University to share with us his views on the history of the Nuremberg Trials, the history of accountability and justice. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you to our university hosts and March of the Living hosts, and to all of you. My opportunity this morning in this brief period of time is to discuss the history of the Nuremberg Trials. And I want to first set the stage in the broader landscape of post-World War II Europe. There were thousands of trials of war criminals following World War II. Most were national trials, often military trials, focused on crimes perpetrated in particular locations. The Nuremberg trials, a small subset, were 13 trials of arch criminals, those whose crimes transcended any particular location. In those 13 Nuremberg trials, one and only one was an international four-nation trial. The United States, the USSR, the United Kingdom, and France. That was the trial of 1945-1946. It was followed, 1946 through 1949, by 12 subsequent US-only Nuremberg trials. So in the landscape of prosecution and accountability, frightfully partial though it was, Nuremberg is a slice, albeit a high slice, a top slice of accountability. I'll approach this in 10 topics. I'm going to speak very briefly about the background and then about international progress preceding World War II. Third, the process of national and human regression that was embodied in Nazism. Fourth, the war itself. Fifth, legal analysis and condemnation during the war years. Sixth, the military defeat of the Nazis. Seven, the Allied International Nuremberg Trial of 1945-1946. Eighth, the 12 subsequent American proceedings. Ninth, the legal legacy of those Nuremberg trials. And tenth, the human rights or Holocaust legacy of that process. Uh, that's all that I'll be doing here. Uh, first, if I may have the first slide, is a matter of background. This is a beautiful painting that depicts the reality of human behavior across the millennium. War was a matter of power, a matter of sovereignty, a matter of, frankly, legality, because no contrary thinking largely controlled this endeavor, and a realm of impunity. That is the backdrop. That is humanity's avocation and history through many, many centuries, up through and including the 19th century. Second, next slide, please. That view of power and sovereignty begins to give way, second slide, to a view of legality. This is a process that begins at the end of the 19th century with the Hague Conventions that define war crimes, rules of behavior between civilized nations engaging in that endeavor. It begins to include post-World War I, post-continental global calamity thinking about prescribing war, about creating criminal liability for the perpetration of war, even up to the level of leaders. And it begins to include treaty commitments, both bilateral and multinational treaties, that forswear this human activity of such dire destructiveness. This is an image of the signing of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, the President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, inking on behalf of the United States, the commitment that the nations henceforth forswear war as an instrument of national policy. Next slide, please. My third topic, national and human regression. This is simply the story of Nazism. And in the powerful film we've just seen, you've seen it. I'd like to move through a series of slides. Next, please. 
That was Nuremberg, and this is Dachau, the first of the concentration camps, created in 1933, a place to grab and confine and detain and subjugate enemies of the Nazi state. The next slide. That is Hitler in the streets of Nuremberg, a symbolic site of party gatherings beginning in 1933, a conceit of the Nazis that they were connected back to the Holy Roman Empire, which used Nuremberg as one of its castle cities and was a grand part of civilization. Next slide, please. That's the party rally grounds erected on the outskirts of the Altstadt, the old city, the Zeppelin Field, and the massed, fervent, patriotic, festival-going Nazis assembling in Nuremberg each fall beginning in 1933. The next slide, please. That's the heart of Nuremberg a square that they renamed the Adolf Hitler Platz, a church, Frauenkirche, the Church of Our Old Lady, that was part of the, the Church of Our Lady, which is part of the gathering and the celebrating of these rallies. The next slide, please. That's Frauenkirche in the background, and that is Hitler, plus Hermann Goering, plus others in the foreground. Again, a Nazi party rally in September of 1934. The next slide. That slide you've already seen. This is a eugenicist chart of madness which promulgates in a diagram the Nuremberg Laws. It's the Nazis deciding who is a Jew. And from that, the consequences that flow from that. And the next slide is a passport of one young teenager, Arno Hamburg, a man I was lucky to know. He became the leader of the Jewish community of Nuremberg in the post-war years. In the meantime, as a teenager, he was declared a Jew. He was sent with that pink J. He barely made it to Trieste and then to Palestine and then to the British Army and fighting and being a part of the Liberating Army to return to Nuremberg. But the Nuremberg Laws draping one individual life is a glimpse of what this system was across the 1930s. The next slide. My fourth topic is simply the war. World War II cannot be underestimated and should never be forgotten. Um, remember and never forget is, of, of course, why we're here in many dimensions. Uh, but the war is a contest. The waging of aggression, the perpetration of atrocity is the framework for what we are talking about as Holocaust. And World War II is, in our time and perhaps for all of our time, the most significant topic for human attention. These are German tanks rolling into Poland in September of 1939. And the next slide, that is one small child in a Polish city with his hands up. A glimpse of everything that followed from that aggression, from atrocity, what became extermination. The next slide. My fifth topic is legal analysis and condemnation. War as crime. This is a thought process that, as I said, began in the post-World War I era, and some antecedents going much further back uh, embody that idea. But particularly in the Allied nations, particularly in the late 30s as Germany is on the march, and into the 1940s, legal thinking about war as crime begins to make great progress. This is a photo taken in the Oval Office. Franklin Roosevelt shaking the hand of his Attorney General, Robert H. Jackson, who is concluding 18 months as the American Chief Law Enforcement Officer and has just been appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The next slide. During those 18 months, Jackson as Attorney General, as Roosevelt's Chief Legal Officer, was engaged in war preparatory work. And a large part of that was legal thinking about how the United States could navigate, frankly, an isolationist, ocean-protected United States, buttressed by neutrality laws, keeping it from involvement in the European conflict. How the United States could navigate to provide military assistance to Great Britain, which by June of 1940 stood alone. These are over-age World War I era destroyers, which Winston Churchill begged for and desperately needed. And Robert Jackson's legal opinion of the summer of 1940 is the legal approval for his client, Franklin Roosevelt, to provide that assistance, which was part of securing the North Atlantic and Britain's survival. And the argument in that legal opinion is that it is not a violation of neutrality laws for the United States to provide assistance. Because Britain is not merely a belligerent in an illegal activity, Britain is a victim of aggression, of war as a crime perpetrated by the Nazis as aggressors. In other words, treaty and theory and Kellogg-Briand is now legal opinion. Jackson, in the ensuing months, this is August of 1940, with the legal opinion, 
um, develops that theory in a series of very high profile speeches and writings. One, interestingly, was assisted behind the scenes by a Cambridge University theorist, Hirsch Lauterpacht, who becomes a major contributor to the British delegation and the thinking that is Nuremberg. Next slide. This legal thinking and process is not just limited to the Oval Office or the US Department of Justice. This is the Moscow Conference and the signing of the Moscow Declaration in November of 1943. Cordell Hall, the US Secretary of State, Molotov, the Russian minister, and other foreign ministers. Uh, by this point, although brutal fighting remained, it was clear that the Allies would prevail. And the thinking now becomes, what will we do with the vanquished? And the commitment, first at a very high level of generality, is that we will, as allies, internationally hold these perpetrators accountable. And the next slide. This continues in February of 1945 at Yalta, the last of the big, big three meetings, if you will, which reiterates this declaration. Now, of course, that process of legal analysis and condemnation can't get ahead of the reality. So my fifth topic, the next slide, is military defeat. Uh, I'm sorry, that is the Nazi surrender at Reims, um, May of 1945, until the war is won, until the military endeavor succeeds, until the prisoners are taken, legal thinking and plans are in the air. But now they're operational on the ground. The next slide. My seventh topic is the Allied International Prosecution at Nuremberg. That's Robert Jackson, age 53, a US Supreme Court Justice for four years in 1945. Next slide. When Harry Truman, the new president of the United States, has to deliver on the Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin commitment to hold the Nazi perpetrators legally accountable. Harry Truman reaches for America's leading, by far, talented by enormous measures, legal figure, and recruits Jackson off the Supreme Court to head the American process of delivering on that commitment. It's frankly a first American move to cause the British and the Soviets and the French to comparably staff this commitment. The next slide. Jackson at the Supreme Court in May 1945 believed this was a turnkey endeavor, that the evidence was assembled, that the plan was in place, that the trials were ready to go, and frankly at the moment Truman recruited him in April 1945, that this would be the trial of Adolf Hitler and a small inner circle of perpetrators with him. Of course, none of that materialized. The next slide, please. What was first required during the summer of 1945 was hard multinational diplomacy. This is Church House at Westminster Abbey. Uh, it is the Church of England Conference Center today. Next slide. Next slide. Nuremberg had been bombed to smithereens, both by the British and by the Americans. So how, one might ask, could Nuremberg even be contemplated as a trial site? The next slide. On the outskirts, down the Fertestrasse towards the adjacent city of Fert, was this largely intact courthouse complex, the Palace of Justice. The front building you see is the courthouse, and the wheel and spoke behind it you see is the prison complex. Next slide. It had been struck by the stray bomb or two. You see the missing section of roof. And the next slide. Above the four windows, you see the roof repairs. The four windows are courtroom 600, the site of the Nuremberg trial. But this could be, and promptly was, rehabilitated and reconstructed to be the site could the Allies work out the plan. Next slide. This was the courtroom and its disrepair. Next slide. This is where the heavy negotiation that vultures and complemented London occurred. Potsdam, late July 1945. A further big three, next big three, delivery on the commitment. And a reiteration, including by Stalin, that the Soviets would remain a part of this process. Next slide. Which took the London conference to the finish line. On August 8, 1945, Jackson and the British High Chancellor to the left French minister to the right and a Soviet official off camera signed the London Agreement and Charter. This created the world's first international criminal court, the International Military Tribunal. So named not because it was martial law, because it was a device of military occupation in that land that had been Germany. It had jurisdiction over four crimes, conspiracy or common plan and agreement, the waging of aggressive war or breach of peace, 
the commission of war crimes, and in an international agreement for the first time, the novel concept of crimes against humanity. It created also a system of due process. This international military tribunal with jurisdiction over those crimes would provide defendants the right to counsel of choice, to discovery of evidence, to compulsory process to assemble witnesses, to compensation and resources to make their defense, to a public trial proceeding before an independent judiciary which would admit relevant evidence broadly construed and which would hold the prosecutor to a burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. This tribunal also had limits. Two cocaine arguments, you too, no clean hands arguments, were ruled out of bounds. Head of state immunity, a historical prerogative, was declared null and void. And following orders was declared inadmissible as a defense. Admissible as mitigation of punishment, but not as a theory of exculpation. From that process, next slide, followed indictment and the convening of the IMT. This is its original session in Berlin in October, and soon 24 individuals and six Nazi organizations were indicted. The indictment contained the word genocide, coined by Polish lawyer Rafael Lemkin, a consultant and advisor to Jackson's staff, who fought hard for his word to make, be part of this indictment. It included a charge against the Nazis of perpetrating the murders of over 22,000 Polish army officers in the Katyn Forest. Next slide. It included particularly, as one of the 24 defendants, charges against this man, Hans Frank, the Gauleiter of Poland, the general government, the man who presided in the office space very near us in the Babel Castle. As Jackson said in his opening statement in Nuremberg, quote, a lawyer by profession, I must say with shame. Next slide. The international trial opened in November of 1945. Notice an interesting juxtaposition. The motto of Yagyalonian University, mind over power, is echoed by the opening paragraph of Robert Jackson's opening statement in Nuremberg, where he described this trial as the greatest tribute that power has ever paid to reason. The Allied power and unconditional surrender and military occupation was the power to exterminate, to execute, to brutally finish whatever quantity of Nazis the will of the Allies wished to impose that. And they restrained themselves in the name of rule of law and the procedures outlined in that London agreement. The Nuremberg trial proceeded over the course of the next year with national cases, with defense cases, and then with cases against the Nazi organizations. It was largely a documentary trial, next slide please, including film evidence of concentration camps as they were liberated and film evidence of the Nazis and their power. It also included victim witnesses. Next slide, please. And these 24 defendants, Hermann Goering, first in the box, each had a chance to make his defense. Next slide, please. Jackson at the prosecutor table on the next slide. At the podium, next slide, was perhaps the most eloquent courtroom voice the world has ever seen. And at the end of the year, the Nuremberg trial delivered its judgment. First, as to the legality, international law prescribed the conduct charged. These were crimes against the international order. Second, verdicts against individuals, 18 convicted and three acquitted. Sentences against those 18 convicted, 12 sentenced to death, seven sentenced to terms of years. One was in abstention, so that's a 19. Three organizations were convicted and three were found non-criminal. And as to the continued forest charge, it was not mentioned in the Nuremberg judgment because as Hermann Goering told his lawyer, we did not do that. And the defense attorneys were able to make that case and the tribunal recognized that by simply dropping out that particular. My eighth topic, the American prosecutions. Here I'll simply give you a list. These subsequent proceedings followed the fracturing, the Cold War ending the international alliance. They considered a next layer and sectors of perpetration. So the doctor's trial, the Earhart Milch trial, the judge's trial, portrayed in the film Judgment at Nuremberg, the Pohl trial, the Flick trial, the IG Farben trial, a slave labor industrial combine, including factory work at Auschwitz, the hostages trial, the high command trial, the Einsatzgruppen trial, the Crook trial, the ministry's trial, and the uh, high command. 
nearly 200 more defendants, a small number, were held accountable. And not all of them were convicted in that process. And then the Nuremberg trial process came to an end. So two final topics. Next slide. First, uh, I'm sorry, this is Telford Taylor with Jackson. I mean to give credit to General Taylor, who succeeded Jackson and was the chief prosecutor. Next slide. Presiding over those 12 subsequent American proceedings, which are very deeply understudied. Next slide. The legal legacy of Nuremberg. The legal legacy draws on major concepts, including law and will and commitment and power and alliance. The principles enunciated in Nuremberg become, after an interregnum of 50 years and the Cold War, the modern era of international justice. This is the beautiful new building of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which is one descendant institution from the Nuremberg trial. It is a precedent, and this legal landscape is a new and more positive meaning of the phrase Nuremberg laws. But next slide. I'd like to conclude by talking about the human rights and the Holocaust legacy. The trials, and especially the international trial, were war trials. The breaching of peace, the commission of aggressive war, was the principal crime at Nuremberg. And the other crimes were in the context of that framework and that understanding. But these trials were also didactic educational enterprises, particularly about the enormity of human rights crimes. And the documentary record that they delivered included the Hasbach memo, and in time the Bonsai Conference memo, and other planning and implementation documents which show the enormity of the Holocaust. This is a witness called by the defense because the Allies had captured him and notified the defendants that he was now available. Rudolf First, who had been the commandant of Auschwitz. 1942, 1943, into early 1944. And he was called by the defense of Ernst Kaltenbrunner, a Nuremberg defendant, to testify to the small fact that Kaltenbrunner had never visited Auschwitz. Of course, on cross-examination, that opened the door to Hearst testifying with exaggeration, sadly, um, sickly, about the enormity of what had happened at Auschwitz, the deliberate extermination of more than a million lives, primarily Jews. That record, next slide, of the Nuremberg trial includes not just a witness, but includes this dawning understanding, as this map shows, of the concentration camp and in least the extermination camp system. And the next slide, the publication of the record of the Holocaust. Nuremberg didn't enter as a Holocaust project, but Nuremberg produced a Holocaust understanding. And for us, that record, for us in the 1940s, and for us today, is a basis for all the human rights work going forward. The Geneva Conventions, the Genocide Convention, the jurisdictions of international and national tribunals. And final slide, for us to march. For us to march as lawyers and as scholars and as teachers and as students and as citizens, and for us to march tomorrow. Thank you very much.